Welcome to the Meme Tune Program, Series 2, Episode 4. Coming up in today's prog, we do some maths in Switched on Cyber Synths. Synthesizer Club is all about the Yamahas. Patching today features the worst modular synth ever made. And Video Lab looks through the lens of an old video camera. But first up, it's a little black Casio VZ10M in little black boxes.
today's episode, I'm going to be looking at an interesting aspect of electronic rhythm composition, which can be incorporated into cybernetic and generative synthesizer patches. The Euclidean algorithm is based on the Greek theorist Euclid's seminal treatise on mathematical definitions entitled Elements, published around 300 BC. His algorithm computes the greatest common divisor of any two whole numbers, and using his idea, it's possible to create fascinating rhythms and polyrhythms. The central property of Euclidean rhythms is that their numeric patterns are distributed as evenly as possible through each cycle of music. And using the algorithm as our key, we can unlock the ancient secrets of tribal polyrhythms. The algorithm itself is quite simple, but its rules must be followed carefully. Let's take a simple example first to see what the process is using Euclidean rhythm 3-8. The first number is the amount of active steps in the sequence, in this case 3, represented by the pink beads. And the second is the total number of steps before it loops round. This leaves five inactive notes, which are the blue beads. Euclid's algorithm is then used to compute the most even distribution of active notes compared to inactive notes in any given sequence. To begin dividing the notes up equally, we shift the inactive notes to go between the active notes, leaving any remainders at the end like this. This is repeated until only one group of remainders are left, like this. So the Euclidean rhythm set for the numbers 3, 8 yields the following pattern. Using a sequencer, it would look and sound like this. Let's try a more complex example, using the same Euclidean rules. Here is Euclid rhythm 712. First we shift the inactive notes to go between the active notes, leaving any remainders at the end. This is repeated until only one group of remainders are left. So the Euclidean rhythm set for the numbers 712 yields the following pattern. Using the sequencer, it would look and sound like this. Things start to get much more interesting when two or more sequences of different lengths are put together.
And it's these polyrhythmic ideas that we can incorporate into the larger context of generative cybernetic modular compositions. Synthesizer Club Yamaha
I'm patching today on the Pyre 4700 modular system made in Oklahoma City, USA in 1974. The Pyre is probably the worst modular synth ever made, but that's why I love it. Let me explain. Sometimes being limited by an instrument's constraints can be a good thing. When you're forced to work within certain limitations, you inevitably come up with something you're not expecting, pushing you outside your comfort zone. In truth, the Pyre can sound really good with its very vintage sounding VCOs and filters and its incredibly punchy envelopes. It has a beautiful early 70s tone to it, combining some of the characteristics of the early Bukulas with a bit of Moog-like fatness as well. Its limitations come from its distinct lack of features and its lack of range. For example, the single LFO module is not voltage controllable and it doesn't go very slowly at all. Everything is as basic as it could be and it has no really unique modules to get stuck into. But when you hit its sweet spot it can sound very satisfying and very of its time which is something I like in a synth. The patching technique is the same as on the Bukula in that it separates audio on tiny jack connectors and the control voltages on bananas. But that's where the similarities end. Ok it has a certain rubberiness to the envelope and filter combination, a bit like the Bukula low pass gate, but in general this system is defined by its limitations unlike the Bukula which is defined by its open-endedness. But as I say the 4700 still has a lot of charm. Pyre was started in 1972 by electronics wizard John Simonton. His first products were sold to the DIY electronics kit market through various magazines this was a popular new scene at the time and Pyre became one of the leading brands making various musical electronic instruments and gizmos. In fact, Simonton pioneered this DIY modular synth scene in the early 1970s and even started publishing his own magazine in 1975 called Polyphony. It ran for many years and eventually evolved into Electronic Musician magazine in the mid 1980s, which is still going strong today. The 4700 that he sold in kits in the early 1970s was built to a very tight budget and it was designed for hobbyists to build themselves at home. And that's why it doesn't really compare to a fully fledged modular system from companies like Moog, ARP or Bukula. However, it's still packed full of 1970s circuits inside the modules and for that reason I like having it around. Here's today's patch. The Pyre sequencer, although simple, has an unusual 12 step length and each step can be patched to be the looping point. So let's start by patching the 12th output to the reset input. I'll take the internal sequencer clock out to trigger our first envelope.
I'll take the envelope signal out to our first filter CV in. I'm going to combine several oscillator signals to go into the filter. So I'll use the 4 channel mixer to do this. I'll use the saw and square out of the first VCO. and the triangle and square from a second VCO. Then I'll modify their square wave pulse width with the envelope. Both VCOs will have their pitch controlled from the sequencer. Then the mixed VCOs go into the filter. The low pass output will go into a second filter which will be our main output with the low pass being on the left and the band pass on the right. I'll use an LFO to change the frequency of filter 2. as well as a variable CV source which I'll add to the filter's own variable source as it doesn't quite do the job properly on its own due to its limited range. Now I'll set up a second envelope and VCA to send out on a third channel to beef up the sound a bit. You can hear the way the envelope and filter combines to produce a really nice percussive thud to the notes at various settings. I'll also add in the very cute Pia flanger on a fourth channel. This is a really unique sounding Bucket Brigade flanger phaser effect. And that's today's patch.
In today's episode of Video Lab, I'm going to look at the type of camera that I shot my short film on. I wanted the film to have a very particular look and feel to it. And I'll try and explain what this was and why I wanted to use it. Video cameras were introduced in the 1950s as a way of transmitting live broadcasts as opposed to cinema cameras which use film that has to be processed before it can be viewed. Video uses cathode ray tubes to produce an instant colour image. It has one tube each for red, blue and green which are combined inside the camera. The image is available in real time to go to a screen or a transmitter or a recorder. These cameras were initially very expensive to own and were originally the exclusive domain of large national broadcasters and TV companies. In the mid-1970s, a new video era began because news networks wanted cameras that could be taken outside of the TV studio to gather news footage on location. Manufacturers began developing this video gear with ever more portable cameras, transmitters and recorders. For a brief period in the early 1980s, many such tube cameras were made. This is one of my favourite periods of TV because the video images produced were so beautiful. They have a very organic, analogue look to them and it's something that cannot be simulated in any other way. In the mid-1980s, a new technology came along which replaced the three cathode tubes with integrated circuits that were light sensitive called charged couple devices or CCDs. These cameras were far more reliable and portable, much easier to set up, more robust and had better definition from a technical point of view. However, in my opinion, they lost the magical look of the tube cameras they replaced. Here's a comparison between the tube camera and an early CCD camera. You can see the difference in the way it looks. Next time, I'll be looking at the special effects machines I used on the film. Well, that's it for the Meme Tune Programme, Series 2. 
episode four. Bye for now.